Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fact I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Seated. Uh, we're lo really looking forward to our men's trio this morning. We've got uh, Tom and Jerry. Yeah, some of y'all got that. Okay, Tom and Jerry and Charlie. Okay. <laughs> I had to do that, guys. I'm sorry. That's, That's all right. That's all right. We get all in the mouth. <laughs> Dave, we'll give it our best shot. That's right. <laughs> I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear Falling on my ear The Son of God discloses talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known he speaks and the sound of Every day, 
none other has ever known. I'd stay in the garden with him, though the night around me is falling, and he bids me go through the voice of woe. His voice to me is calling, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tear. Children can be dismissed, age three to seven, to Children's Church. Children, three to seven. I know we got a few that are out sick. We got any? All right, good deal. All right, so this morning, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to start in Acts chapter number 16. We're going to talk about today believing and being saved. Now, we're going to talk about that from two different perspectives today. One of them is, if you're lost, you desperately need to believe and be saved, right? Uh, and then the other perspective is this. Now that we are saved, we need to continue to believe the Lord because we are already saved and we are going to be saved. And folks, I want you to realize this. This is those, as bad as it's going to get. I'm talking about the world. I guarantee you it could get worse in the world, Right? Some people take that it can't get any worse as some kind of a challenge, but uh, I want you to realize it can get a lot worse in the world. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're living in pretty good times compared to the history of the world. How many of y'all know that? Compared to the history of the world, we are living in probably some of the easiest times that there ever have been. Truly in America, we're living in the most prosperous times uh, that Americans ever have. Now, granted, people's dollar may used to have gone a little farther than our dollar, but might I remind you of modern medicines and things? Um, folks, we have uh, a lot of people on the planet because of modern medicine. If it wasn't for modern medicine, we would be like it was back in 1900, where there were only about 2 billion people on the earth. Y'all do realize in the last 100 years, the population of the earth has tripled. Hey, y'all, shut that door out there. Y'all are a little loud out there. All right. <laughs> They're more excited than y'all are. Come on, help me out here. <laughs> uh, but I want you to realize that. Most people don't realize it. You know, in 1900, there wasn't but like a billion people. Now we're pushing towards eight, folks. Come on, y'all. Uh, I mean, the world is changing. By the way, uh, didn't the Bible say something about that? Like knowledge would increase? And people would run to and fro in the last days, right? I believe we're there, and I believe we're getting real close. How about you? Nevertheless, as we come into this scripture, this scripture deals with Paul and Silas, and you know the account at midnight, they, they're going to sing praises unto God, their bands are going to be loose. We're going to read this in just a moment. Uh, the jailer's about to kill himself, and, and they said, hey, don't do yourself any harm. And what does that jailer cry out? He cries out that, that great statement about, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? How many of y'all have read this chapter before? Amen, most of you have. And so, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And the answer is so simple, and salvation answer is so simple. It's been a while since we just went over the simplicity of salvation. And since these things go out on the internet, I want to make sure people understand how simple it is to be saved. 
You simply believe on the finished work of the Lord Jesus. Put your trust in Him. That's it, y'all. Salvation is trusting in what Jesus did. It's not repeating a prayer. It's not being baptized in water. It's not joining a church. It's not turning over a new leaf. It's not anything that you do. It's all what God does and, you, and what God has already done for you. And you just put your trust and faith in that. Well, folks, I want you to know salvation is so simple and it is the simplicity of salvation that stumbles people. And you and I today need to realize that people are seeking the hard way to do everything. Let me try that one more time. We're doing everything the hard way. We're trying to live the hard way. I mean, think about this. All these gadgets we have are supposed to save us time make life easier, and give you more rest for your mind. How are we doing with all that? Not real good, are we? You want to know why? Because of all the gadgets that are supposed to take, up, uh, take us time off and give us ease. We buy so many gadgets and none of us know how to do the gadgets, fix the gadgets, operate the gadgets. Smartphones are a whole lot smarter than we are, am I right? And then when they don't work right, how many of y'all get so frustrated you're ready to throw stuff across the room? How many of y'all have thrown stuff across the room? <laughs> yeah, I have too. But I want you to realize we're living in a day when people make things so difficult, so complex. And you think about it, cooking food used to be so simple. You build a fire, you throw it on there, when it's done, you eat it. I mean, that's simplicity. Now you got 18,000 ingredients. It all has to be stirred, baked, shaked, and all that stuff. Microwave, nuked, and everything else. And then it still don't taste right, does it? Right. And we get frustrated with everything. Folks, I do that too, and I'm sure you do. If we could just go back to simpler times. How many of y'all believe that? How many of y'all would agree with this? If we could just go back to simpler thinking. I remember the days when, when you could just come home from work, and go fishing, take a little ride. If anybody called, it went to the house. You didn't worry about it. If somebody needed you, they'd figure you'd come home eventually because you're going to get sleepy or hungry, right? And they'll catch you at the house. Remember the days on the weekends when, when you didn't have to run everywhere? Y'all remember the days when kids didn't have everything under the sun to do? Yeah. Saturday morning. Y'all remember Saturday morning? You could, you, we had chores to do. We had work to do. We had to cut wood and take care of animals and whatnot. But then we'd have a little bit of time to play. Have a little time to sit and watch Super Friends or something. <laughs> watch Tom and Jerry and Charlie. <laughs> now, on, on cartoons, right? You know what I'm saying? We had such a simpler time. Everything is so complex in our world. I want you to realize as we read this, what's taking place is during a time where people's lives were much simpler and things impacted them much greater. I say all this to say this, and you'll understand when we're done. But right now we have so many things that take our attention away from Jesus. We have so many things that take our attention away from what's really important in life. What is important in life? Your family, your friends, your labor. Most important is your God. And everything takes our time. And all these things that we have that are supposed to give us more leisure, they actually suck the life out of us. Sometimes the greatest thing we can do is stop Come apart, find a quiet place, and just worship our God. Today, on Sunday morning, in this sanctuary, let this be that time for you. If you have your cell phone out, I pray, dear God, you'd kill that thing right now. Put them stupid cell phones away. Don't give me that, it's my Bible app. Throw it down and pick a Bible out of the back of that pew. Learn how to turn pages. Find out where it is in the Bible. One day your phone ain't going to work and you won't have a clue. Pick up a Bible. Look at those white pages and those black or red words we're going to look at. Take the time this morning to let your mind be clear. 
Take your time a little bit this morning to let your heart be clear. Take a little time this morning to thank God you're not like Paul and Silas and you're in a place of persecution where they're going to beat you and, and torment you because of your love for Christ or because of your stand for Christ. Take the time right now to thank God for the freedom that you do have, the peace that you do have, the ability we do have right now to sit in this room and just thank Jesus for dying on that cross for our sins. Take the time right now this morning to just let go of all the world and just believe on the Lord Jesus. Just believe on Him. Believe these words that I'm going to share with you out of the gospel. Believe the testimonies of the ones I'm going to read to you out of the scripture. Just take your time and believe and realize your salvation. Bask in your salvation. And if you are not saved today, cry out to Jesus right where you sit. I don't even care if it's audible. Amen. Cry out to Jesus for your salvation. Put your trust in that finished work of Jesus. And then realize the simplicity that's supposed to be life. Eat, sleep, enjoy your family, enjoy your labor, and worship your God. Everything else is sucking the life out of us. Amen? Let's read this. Now, here we go. Acts chapter number 16, verse 23. Acts 16, verse 23. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Let me stop right there. Let's thank God today that we don't have to deal with this. Now, it could come in our lifetime. Let's pray that it doesn't. But while it's not at our doorstep, let's rejoice, let's praise God, and let's thank God that we live in relative peace. Amen. And let's also thank God for the lesson here. At midnight, they were singing praises unto God. Truly, their bodies were hurting them. Truly, their wounds were causing them problems. But instead of focusing on the wounds and the problems, they focused on God and they started praising and singing unto their God because they knew their God was the only one that truly cared about their condition. Today, you and I need to stop and understand that. The, the world does not care our condition. The world does not care whether you're sick. The world does not care whether you're financially bankrupt. The world does not care if you're going through a family crisis. The world does not care if you're going through a health crisis or a financial crisis. The world does not care, but God does. He knows every hair on your head. He cares for you. Cast your care upon Him. Rest upon the Lord. Rest Rest in the Lord Jesus Christ. Find peace and solace in the Lord Jesus. You will not find it in the activities and the busyness of the world. Verse 26, and suddenly when you start to praise God and you start to rejoice in God, look what happens. All of a sudden things change. Let me stop before I go any further. How many of y'all desperately need something to change in your life? You are at wit's end. You are frustrated. You are struggling. You, you feel blindsided by sin. You feel blindsided by the world. You feel as though you don't belong anymore. You feel as though everything is just, just rotten in the world and you just want to escape this mud ball. Anybody in this place? Then understand it's time for us to praise God. It's time for us to sing. It's time for us to simplify life and get back to what's important. And when we get to what's important... Think about it. What was the most important thing for these men in a time of great trouble, a time of great trial, and a time of great pain was to sing praises and worship God. And when that happened, there was a sudden change. That doesn't mean that God is going to send an earthquake to your house. But God can shake the foundations of your problems. 
the foundations of your issues. Look very carefully. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so the foundation of the prisons were shaken immediately. Immediately. That's the way God does stuff too, folks. Immediately, all the doors were opened and everyone's, everyone's bands were loose. Do you realize that there may be somebody in here that's all wound up tight and your family's wound up tight because you're wound up tight? You realize there might be somebody in this room today, you're about ready to quit, therefore your family's ready to quit. Your family is quitting because they see quit in you. They're frustrated because they see frustration in you. They are ready to throw in the towel because they see that you're there. I want you to understand you are not living an isolated life, dear Christian. And we have got to understand our lives make an impact upon everyone else around us. Mamas and daddies, it's time to simplify life. Grandmas, grandpas, time to simplify life. Eat, sleep, enjoy your labor, enjoy your family, worship your God, and show the victories that are in a peaceful life in Jesus. Y'all still there? Everyone's bands were loosed. I would love to see some younger people's bands loosed in this place today. So worried about what their friends think. So worried about what their peers think. So worried about what their world around them thinks. I'd love to see those bands loosed. I'd love to see some parents' bands loosed. So worried about buying everything to keep up with the, the neighbors. I'd love to see that band loose. So many people have to have, they're, they're in debt up to here. And therefore, because they're in debt up to here, they're swamped under. They can't see the light of day. They can't have any peace. They can't have any joy. And all their, all their life is stress and worry and work. Hmm. I'd like to see that band loose. I'd like to see some grandparents have some bands loose as they look at their grandchildren and see that they're headed down the wrong road and see their children, they've already gone down the wrong road and they're struggling and frustrated and, and they cannot get rest and peace. I'd love to see those bands loose. Amen. Love to see it. And the keeper of the prison awaking out of sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, we're all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could have our bands loose, whereby we're praising God and rejoicing, no matter what befalls us, no matter what life has got for us, where we're singing praises unto God and the people who even hate us, who even imprison us, want to destroy us, would see a difference in us and be saved. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? What keeps you from being that free? If I don't get to the outline today, I could care less. What is it that keeps you, dear Christian, from being free? What is it, dear Christian, that keeps you from singing and rejoicing and praising God? Grandparent, what is it that keeps you awake at night? so that you can't sleep. Dear parents, what is it that keeps you going? Why are you still struggling to have everything under the sun? Knowing it's just swamping you under. And dear young people, you're supposed to be in the freest time of your life. You're supposed to be playing, enjoying the outside, not bound up inside and truly not being bound up on the inside. You should be free. These are the freest days of your life and if you're all bound up now, you're headed for a world of heartache and pain. You need to learn. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? That word saved means to be rescued or delivered. What do I need to do? That's the key. That's the verse. And this is the message. What must I do? What must I do to be saved? 
Notice this, and they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt be saved, thy, and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in the house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we come to you this morning. We want to thank you. We want to praise you just for allowing us to read this scripture. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us the opportunity to be gathered together in this place. And Father, I sense as you change this message from what you had stirred first in my heart, I pray, God, that you would just use it. Lord, just develop it. Lord God, just speak it as you desire. Just use me as a vessel, I pray. And Almighty God, whatever the need is in this congregation this morning, I lift it to you, whatever the need in the heart, the soul, the life, I pray, God, you'd meet it as only you can. Almighty God, we believe that you are able, we believe that you are mighty, we believe that you are strong. And Almighty God, we come to you and ask you, Lord, that you would change us and mold us and shape us. Help us to be more like Jesus and less like us. Help us to be more fit and ready for the kingdom and less desirous of this world. Oh God, please have your will in your way. In the precious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. I want you to notice a couple of things. First of all, I want you to notice the Apostle Paul and Silas in this story, especially the Apostle Paul. He's in a place whereby he is uh, paying a price for being a believer. Now, I want you to realize Paul knew the cost of following Christ if anybody in the Bible does. Now, this is early on in Paul's ministry, but he's going to pay a terrible price for being a believer in the Lord Jesus. You and I do not understand what Paul's life was really like. Many times we think of Paul, when we read Paul's writings, we think he was so brash and so, so strict and so harsh. But the fact of the matter was, he's very loving, very caring, very kind. And we must understand his perspective comes from a heart of sacrifice, a life of sacrifice, a mind of sacrifice. Paul knew the cost. He knew what it meant to be in prison. He knew what it meant to be beaten. He was going to learn even more what it was going to mean. It was a common occurrence for Paul. In 2 Corinthians 11, we read this. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors, more abundant. In stripes above measure. In prisons, more frequent. In deaths, often. Of the Jews, five times. Think about this. Received I 40 stripes, save one. The 40th stripe will kill you people. Understand that. Forty stripes save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. I told the guys what that meant. Trust me, you don't want that. Once I was stoned. Thrice I, I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day have I been in the deep and journeyings often in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of heathen, in perils of the city, in perils of the wilderness, in perils of the sea, in perils of false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst and fastings and cold and nakedness. How many of us can say we've never seen that? We've never experienced that. Understand this, when you read the Apostle's Paul, Apostle Paul's life, is he ever looking, is he ever looking for the easy way out? Is he ever looking for things to, to work for him to make his life easier? No, because the Apostle Paul understood that he had but one life to live, one experience to have, one life to live, one experience to go through for the glory of God Almighty that bought him and paid for him. The world is dying and going to hell because we in the church in our generation are looking for someone else to do what God calls us to do so that we don't have these bad experiences. We in the church today are looking for easy ways. We have easy ways to cook stuff. We got easy, I mean, you got Jiffy Lube to take your car. Granted, they're probably going to ruin it. You're going to wish you hadn't have gone there after you did. Come on. But we got Jiffy ways of doing everything. You got Jiffy popcorn. That's been out for what, 50 years? 
Longer than that, I have no idea. But you got, you got everything rapid, everything quick, everything immediate, everything right now. I mean, that's our world. We think that if somebody, if we have a friend that's sick, we just go to God and say, God, he's sick, fix him. And then if God doesn't fix him, that's it. Folks, our prayer life is a prayer life. It's not a prayer second. It's not a prayer minute. It's not a prayer day. It's not a prayer week. It's a prayer life. And we have to understand that God wants us to go continually. Remember the unjust, uh, the, that, that wicked man, the un, that, that judge, the unjust judge, and the woman who went to him and kept on and kept on. That's the way we're supposed to do with God. Not that God doesn't hear us. Not that God doesn't know and God doesn't understand. The hand of God is moved by prayer. And God always answers prayer. It's either yes, it's no, or hang on. Maybe. Wait. Something of that nature. Is everybody with me? We need to learn the lessons here. Everybody wants something immediately. You have a, a, a sickness in your own life you want it taken care of immediately. I mean, you go to, you, you have a desire for a hamburger today. You can have it immediately. Everything is right now in our world. And folks, we have forgotten that we're supposed to be living a life of belief because of our salvation. We expect when we have a, a son, a daughter, a, a grandchild, a friend, a neighbor, a co-worker, uh, our loved one who's not saved, we expect that we tell them one time the gospel, they're going to get saved, and if they don't, then God's not faithful. Folks, it's called a prayer life, and you've got to pray for them, agonize over them. We have lost the art of suffering in prayer, agonizing in prayer, because our hearts are filled with a desire for some soul to come to know Jesus. The reason our hearts are so filled with everything else is because everything else takes its place. It's common sense, is it not? Are y'all with me? You get up this morning, think about this, you get up this morning, and you, it's Sunday morning, it's the Lord's Day, and we're, we're going to worship the Lord today, and we think today I'm going to pray, I'm, I'm going to give my heart to Christ, I'm going to thank Him for my salvation, I'm, I'm going to live for Him today, and then out of habit, we pick up a remote, we click on the TV, we're not praying, we're not reading the Bible, we're not focusing on Jesus. Before you know it, if you're not careful, you will go from show to show to show, and then somebody's going to call you on your cell phone. You go from show to a commercial to Facebook, back to the show, back to a commercial, back to Facebook, and you just go round and round and round. The next thing you know, the day is over. <sighs> People go, you want to go out to eat? I see this all the time. You want to go out to eat? Sure, let's go out to eat. Leave your cell phones in the car, people. Just leave them in the car. Walk in there and talk to the people who want to spend time with you. I see it all the time. We're, we're not engaged with anybody in humanity anymore. We don't, ag we don't have time to take up prayer requests with them. We don't have time to talk to them. Lord knows we don't have time to even pray with them. I remember not too long ago, I've been here, well, it's been a long time. When I first got here, every Wednesday night and every Sunday night after church, we had different groups to get together. We'd go to Wendy's. We'd go to, go to Hardy's. We'd go to different places after church. And we'd sit down. We didn't have cell phones. If we had them, we didn't have them with us because they weren't important then. And we'd sit around in those restaurants for an hour or two uh, just having a little cup of coffee or, or having a sandwich or something and just talk to one another. Find out what's going on in their life. We knew about their children. We knew about their grandchildren. We knew about what was going on in their neighborhood. We knew about what was wrong with their house. We knew that their car had let them down. We knew all this stuff because we weren't trying to rush to get to something to entertain us. We were spending quality time with people. The Apostle Paul gave a list of all of these problems that he had. And if anybody would have an excuse for not having time to do anything, it would be him, don't you think? 
Couldn't handle that. Couldn't pray for anybody. Couldn't do anything because I was in prison. Paul said, I'm free from the blood of all men. While he was in prison, he made the best of everything. He made sure he invested his life in other people. He made sure he prayed to God. He made sure he had a spiritual life. I'm afraid today we have forgotten what the spiritual life even means. If you're with me, say amen. amen. I want you to notice this. Paul and Silas had been beaten. Here they are. They had, they had been beaten because they had done a work for the Lord Jesus. And they were suffering. You see, when you were beaten back then, it wasn't like we do it today. You don't even give a child a swat on the butt anymore. You give them a time out. How's that working for you? <laughs> Knock them out, better than time out, any time, any day. Not real. I'm not talking about abusing children. But they do need correction. And they need a correction that stings so they'll remember. Amen. Not abuse. If you spank them, you also need to hug them and love them. You need to kiss them on the cheek and tell them you love them. Not just beat them and yell at them. That's abuse. But you and I need to stop and understand this great truth here. They had been beaten. They were in pain physically. Think about that. When they got whipped in those days, they were whipped with a whip, a leather whip. And if it was a cat of nine tails, which it probably wasn't, just a regular whip, they still would have tore their hide open. But instead of complaining, instead of fussing, instead of trying to figure out how they can sue this man and call out for their rights and go get me a lawyer... Instead, they realized that they were experiencing this pain because they had done something great for God. You see, anytime you do anything great for God, you need to hear me and hear me well. Anytime you decide that you're going to give your life, like Paul and Silas gave their life, if you're going to give your life to Jesus and you're going to give your life to the service of the Lord and you're going to give your life to do something great for God, there are going to be misunderstandings. There are going to be arguments. There are going to be people that do not like you. They hate you and they hate Jesus in you and they will do anything they can to bring you down to their level. You've got to understand there is sometimes great pain involved in serving Jesus. And we don't want that. We don't want that. I don't know how many men over my course of my life I have met who said, you know, the Lord called me to be a pastor and called me into ministry back in my 20s or my 30s, but because I had a good job, because I had a a, a family, because I had a, a house, because... The real because is because they didn't want the pain and the suffering and the hardships that you go through to surrender your life and go off and prepare. I've met a lot of people too who have said, well, Pastor Paul, that's easy for you. You're a pastor. That's your job. Wrong friend. Wrong friend. I want you to understand something. I was 25 years old when I got saved. When I got saved, I started serving in the church. I had two small boys and a wife. I didn't know anything about a pastor and I didn't know anything about preaching. I started serving in the church. I started teaching uh, little Spanish children. I went from teaching Spanish children to teaching uh, children, uh, older children to teaching men's class. I was a deacon. I was on the buildings and grounds. I was a mission treasurer. I did all that for I ever took one step towards a Bible college. Are y'all listening? I run into people that have excuse after excuse after excuse. Now I guarantee you, Paul and Silas, before they had gotten uh, in the situation, could have said, you know, it's just, I, I mean, it's just too hard. People just don't like me. 
Do you realize, folks, that if you're going to live a Christian life and you're going to serve God, people in your own family are not going to like you? The enemies you're going to find are going to be people in your own family. We need to learn. We believed and were saved. Now we need to learn to believe and live that rescued, saved life so that others can see a difference in us. Everything in this world makes life so much easier, but friend, there is no shortcut for living a Christian life. There's no shortcut for living a Spirit-filled life. A Christian life, a Spirit-filled life, comes from heartache, sorrow, loss, and struggle. It comes from learning that God was mighty enough on the day of our salvation. Y'all remember that day? Remember the day you cried out to Jesus for salvation and God saved your wretched soul? Do you remember the joy that flooded your soul on the inside? And do you remember the weight of the world was taken off and you just felt like God could do anything? Well, what's wrong with you now? Where are you now? God did not change. God did not move. God has not adjusted His position. God is still great. God is still good. God is still mighty. God is still able to do anything and everything and more abundantly than we can even ask or think. The problem is we don't ask and we don't think about it anymore. We don't think about it, therefore we don't ask. And when we're not asking, we're not continuing to think. Why? Because everything else has a sidetrack. <clears throat> well, you know, I have good intentions, Pastor Paul, to give somebody a track. I have good intentions to pray for somebody. I tell people I'll pray for them all the time, but to be honest, I never really do. Because, you know, that takes time. You know, Pastor Paul, I have good intentions to read the Bible. I have good intentions to study the Bible. Y'all realize that reading the Bible and studying the Bible are two different things? Yeah. And the Bible never says to read the Bible, but it says to study the Bible? Yeah, <laughs> Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the Word of God. Study then to show yourself approved. A workman that need not to be ashamed. <coughs> Here's the deal, y'all. Y'all with me? It's quiet in here because it's real, is it not? You and I need to understand, when we sit down and we read the Bible, praise God, I'm glad you read the Bible. Reading the Bible, reading verse by verse, chapter by chapter through the Bible, has this effect upon you. It's like water being run over a dirty cloth. You run enough water over a dirty cloth, it cleans it. The water gets in the fibers and soaks the fibers and looses the dirt so that the dirt then can be washed away. And praise God, we can read the Bible to wash that dirt and that filth away. But when you study the Bible, you're building a barricade between you and that cloth so that that dirty cloth does not impact you. When you study the Word of God... You find out what, what the Word of God is actually about and how you can live a Christian life and how you can walk a Christian existence. <sighs> but in our generation, everybody says, I don't have time. We have time. The average American watches somewhere around 7 to 12 hours of TV a day. 7 to 12 hours of television a day. But we don't have time for the spiritual things. Remember back reading stories, maybe listening to grandma or great grandma when you were children? They didn't have education, maybe had a third grade education. But they knew more Bible than most preachers with doctorate degrees today. Let me try that one more time. Does anybody remember those days? You remember talking to them older folks? They didn't have television. They, they, didn't, they barely had radio. Remember, they'll tell you the good old days. They walked uphill to school both ways in the snow, right? Barefoot. 
with grizzly bears chasing them, right? <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, they didn't have things to simplify their time, but they had time for the simpler things. Remember my grandpa, he was born in 1900. Man never drove a car. Remember him sitting on the porch with me when I was a boy. My grandpa got up at 2 o'clock in the morning, went to his bakery, and he made the morning bread. He'd come home about 10 o'clock, and he would sit with me as a small child from about 10 o'clock to 12.30. At 12.30, he ate lunch. He slept from 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock, and then he went back to make the afternoon bread. He walked every day to his work, never owned a car. And then after the bacon was done for the evening bread, at 7 o'clock, he'd walk back home, read the newspaper, play with me on the floor, and go to bed. 8 o'clock. But I remember the lessons I learned from that old man. I remember him teaching me how to peel an apple. I have his pocket knife. It's about that big. How to peel an apple without breaking the skin. Took a long time for him to teach a boy how to do that. I remember him teaching me the difference between apples and sour apples. Didn't take near as long to teach me that one. I know my grandpa because he invested his life in me. My grandma, on the other hand, the only thing she's worried about was that television. And God helped a little boy that got between her and the television. Get out of my way. You make a better door than a window. I don't have time for that. General Hospital's on. I ain't got time for that. You ain't got time. You ain't doing nothing but sitting on your carcass. You ain't got time for that. I knew who loved me. I knew who actually cared about me. And I can look back and tell you this. The man who had the least amount of time invested the most amount of time in me. Because I was more important in television, football games, basketball games, I was more important. That I knew what real life was about. Here we are, folks. Here's Paul and Silas. They've been beaten. They paid a terrible price. If you live for Jesus, you're going to pay a terrible price. But all of a sudden, they started singing and praising God. They did that because they knew God. I go into hospital rooms. And I see people in absolute despair. I get called, somebody's died. Pastor Paul, please come. The body's still at the house. The family is in shambles. I go to other houses and other hospital rooms where people call me, Pastor Paul, so-and-so's died. I'll be right there. And I come in, and this is what I find. Thank you, Jesus. You're good, God. I love you, Lord. I don't understand, God, but I trust you, God. Thank you, Jesus. One day I'll get to see him again. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. Walked into a, into a uh, local establishment of death, as I call them, funeral homes. Got a call, Pastor Paul, would you meet us over here? You know why they wanted me to come over there? 
so we could pray and rejoice. Don't get that call very often. Folks, you sitting here this morning, I'm thankful for every one of you. I praise God for every soul that's here. But there's going to come a time when you're going to be like Paul and Silas and everything's going to fall apart in your life. How you lived for Jesus prior to this, how you've learned of Jesus prior to this, how you have served Jesus prior to this will make the impact upon everybody else around you when you come to this crisis. Because in the good times when you've had time and taken the time to serve God and worship God and love God, when in time, when you've had the time, you've learned of the Lord through the Word and you've allowed the Word to cleanse you and wash you, when you have had the time and in the time you've had the time, you have learned that God is good no matter what. When the hard time comes, you'll be like Paul and Silas and you'll sing at midnight night. You won't lay there and toss and turn. You'll start rejoicing. Oh God, you're good. I don't have a clue what's going on and I don't need to. I just turn it over to you. Thank you, Jesus. In this, I'm going to learn. In this, I'm going to grow. In this, I'm going to become stronger. In this, I'm going to thank you. I'm going to praise you. I'm going to rejoice. In this, I'm giving thanks. It's your will. Thank you, Jesus. The Bible says, immediately. Immediately when? When they were beaten? Immediately when? When they were cast into prison? Immediately when? When they realized the pain they were in? Immediately when they started singing praises unto God at a dark hour. Everyone in that place's bands came loose. That old man, Paul George Leprovod, made an impact on me, Paul Fitzgerald Leprovod. Because in life, that man suffered greatly. Watched his family killed by the Germans. Was a three-year combat vet before he ever turned to 18 years old. Ate rats and worms and bugs and horses in the trenches in World War I. Hitched a slow boat to America with no promise of any food on that boat. Came to America to start a new life and to invest in his family. And I'm thankful that that man suffered everything he suffered and taught me everything he taught me. But I'm twice as grateful for the old men in my life when I was a 20-some-year-old Christian. Men who had lost their wives. Men who had lost children. Men who had lost wealth and jobs. Men who had suffered because life is harsh and were still in church rejoicing, singing, praising and would invite me to go with them and talk to them and pray with them and learn from them. I'm thankful there were some Paul and Silas's in my life when I was bound in sin in alcoholism when I was bound in my lust and filth and greed and hatred I am thankful for the Pauls and Silas's 
no matter how I misspoke to them or mistreated them, they told me of the love and the forgiveness and the mercy of Jesus and they lived it. I'm thankful for a mother-in-law. God, did I just say that? <laughs> Who the first time I met, when she asked me where I went to church, and I said, I don't go to no church. And she said, well, if you did, where would you go? I said, well, I reckon the Catholic church. My family's Catholic. And I saw the tears rolling down her cheeks. And she turned around so I wouldn't see her weeping. It made an impact. Every one of these men, their bands were loose and immediately the jailer, he looked out and, and because he was the jailer, he would have died. The Romans would have killed him if he had lost a prisoner and he would have killed himself. But Paul and Silas said, hey, don't do yourself any harm. We're still here. I'm not only thankful for the old men who taught me, who shared with me, who served and showed me that God was good in that day. I'm thankful that some of them are, have even gone on into glory with faithful endings to their life. They never quit. They never quit. They never quit. <sighs> I've seen people over the last 20 years die from here in a multitude of ways. But I can tell you there have been some who have made tremendous impact because they died faithful. They never quit. Some of them died in sickness. Some of them died suddenly. Some of them died after suffering a great while. But they struggled, served, surrendered until they succumbed. And when they succumbed, they graduated into glory. And I have seen others at the mere thought of sickness at the mere twinge of pain, at the smallest loss, throw in the towel. And I have seen their families quit. I've seen some of their friends quit. I've seen it make a terrible impact. Paul and Silas said, don't do yourself any harm. We're here. And when that man saw that they cared for them, they cared for that jailer. They were more worried about what was going to happen to that jailer than they were that they could have run out of prison. They were happy to be in the agony. They were happy to be in the circumstance. They were happy to be in the struggle. They were happy because of Jesus. And they were praising God and worshiping God. And when this man saw that they were going to stay there because God put them there and there was nowhere else they were going to go, he cried out, Sirs, what must I do to be as rescued, delivered, and saved as you are? Huh. I think far too often we're like that jailer more than we are like Paul and Silas. First hint of trouble, we're ready to do ourselves in. Oh, we're not going to pull a trigger and we're not going to slit our wrists, but we're going to run away. We're going to die a slow, agonizing death of hiding from God and people. Am I right? We're going to die that slow death of, of I'm still going to be in my place, but I'm only going to be in my place physically. I'm not truly going to be there spiritually. There's nothing worse than a slow death for you if you're sitting out there right now and you know your life is not hid in Christ 
and you're going to die and go to hell from a church pew, that's a horrible place to be. But if you're a believer and you're sitting out there and you have absolutely zero intention of ever doing more for Jesus, you have absolutely zero intention of ever surrendering more of your life to Christ or absolutely no intention of ever doing anything to invest your life in other people, you're all about you. Everybody else, stay away. You have already done what this jailer did. You've killed yourself. You're living a horrible death. Separation from the purpose of God, separation from the promises of God, separation, that's what the word death means, separation. Separation from the, the potential that God has for you, separation from the praise God has for you, separation from the victories that God could have you in. Separation from that precious soul you could see come to Jesus or dear older saint, that precious soul that you could call alongside. And maybe you ain't so spiritual and you can teach him the Bible, but maybe you know how to cut an apple without breaking the peel. And don't ever think that even those little things don't mean everything to somebody nobody else cares about. There's a lot of people like my grandma in this church and in every church. You make a better door in the window. I ain't got time for that. Leave me alone. Go play. Don't you have something else to do? Why are you asking me that? I ain't got time for that. But I'd rather they be like my grandpa. Couldn't understand a word the man said because he came from France. But you understood this. And you understood this. That jailer said, Sir, what must I do to be saved? You want to know the simple answer? Here it is. It's not go to church more often. You ought to just be there when the doors are open. That's a no-brainer. It's not read more. Read what you can study. Read what you can learn. The Bible don't say you've got to read three chapters a day to be right with God. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Maybe that's the only verse you need to read today and dwell on that. Maybe you need to meditate on that one. Maybe think on that one. Maybe today is your day. You need to meditate on that verse. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You want the simple answer? You want to live? Now look up here. If you're not saved and you want to be saved, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was God enrobed in flesh. When He hung upon the cross, He became sin for you, that you might become the righteousness of God in Him. He paid the sin debt for you. He died, went into a grave, and on the third day He rose again. He's God laid down his life, picked it up again. Believe on that. That is salvation. That's all I need for salvation. But if you have salvation, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be delivered. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be rescued. I don't know what's got you in prison. I don't know what's got you bound. More of us are like the jailer or them other people in prison. We're not like Paul and Silas. We're like everybody else just laying there in our agony, in our misery. You got chains on. Listen to me. The chains can be set free in the praise and the worship, the adoration, the believing on the Lord Jesus. 
Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and your household. Anybody that just believes Jesus. Now, if you're not Paul and Silas today, and maybe that is you, and praise God if that is you, if that is you, you're rejoicing over this message this morning. But I have to say, most of us are like, mm. holy cow. Am I right? Then we're either like that jailer, lost in our sins, needing to be saved. Or we're like the untold number of people in that jail because of what Paul and Silas were doing, their bands were let loose. Let me be like Paul and Silas for one minute, dear Jesus. And I want to tell you this, there is nothing that's going to bind you to this earth, dear Christian. One day there's going to be a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, and we are out of here. There's coming a day we're going to be in glory. There's coming a day we're going to be glorified. There's coming a day there'll never be any more sin. No more wages of sin for us. <laughs> Until that day, don't just lay there. Join in. Start praising God. Become like Paul and Silas. And oh dear sinner, if you don't know Jesus, be like this jailer and ask what must I do? And when you understand the answer, just believe on the Lord Jesus. Cry unto Jesus. He'll save you. Church don't do it. Religion don't do it. Jesus has already paid it all then you too can be free. The Apostle Paul went through every agony, so much stuff we don't have any idea. And when it came time for him to die, he said this, the time of my departure is at hand. I'm ready to be offered. He was ready to be offered because he was a living sacrifice. May we get there, church. May we learn what it means to be a living sacrifice so that when it comes time for us to be offered, it ain't no big thing. We just roll on, continuing to leave behind a legacy. I was 10 years old when that old man died. As far as I knew in my life, and I'm sure I was wrong, but that was the only human being on planet Earth that loved me. I was a problem, a nuisance, a burden to every other human on life in existence. That old man was the only one that ever truly loved me until I found Jesus. And today, if you cannot be that spiritual, be like that old man and find somebody nobody else cares about. And just love them because Jesus loved you. You'll make a difference in somebody else's life. Let's all stand this morning. I never really got to my outline. It was a good one. Maybe another day. This altar is open to you. If you need to come, you need to pray, you come right now. What number are we singing, brother? Number 489. But if you want to come and you want to pray, you want to ask God to make you like Paul and Silas, if you want to ask God to make you a person that makes a difference in other people's lives, maybe you need to come to the altar and cast your burdens upon the Lord for He cares for you. I don't care whether you've been here a hundred years or this is the first time you've ever walked in the door. This altar is for you. This message is for you, and this church is for you. If you need to come and pray and just cast your burdens, as we begin to sing, you come. You come. Somebody will pray with you. Ladies, if you could pray with the ladies who have come.
All to Jesus I surrender All to Him I freely give I will ever love and trust Him In His presence daily Father God, Lord, we just thank you for allowing us the opportunity to be gathered here in this place. Go with us now to the Sunday school hour. Be with every teacher, be with every student. And Father, just have your will and your way in our hearts and lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. All are dismissed.